Hello, everyone. This is our last recording of the year, um, which is crazy. Um, the last week of the strangest seminar or se semester ever. That is how I am feeling about it. And I'm sure you are too. Um, so let's get to it. Um, our agenda for today is um, we're going to just do a little review about what's due. Um, and then I'm going to ask you to pause and post for your takeaway from chapter nine. I'll show you my model. Um, we're going to talk some about that when we meet together um, in, Zoom, in our Zoom meeting on Tuesday. Um, and then part two, we are going to talk a little bit about weaving texts and strategies together. This um, is the part of the unit that you're not doing, the assignment that you're not doing. I took this away so you didn't have to worry about it, but I did want to at least show you like how would you take these um, texts that you have. And we talked about using the, the novels for literature circles, um, but how could you take some different kinds of genres of texts and weave them together? Um, we'll go over the rubric for the final, um, and then we will conclude with a review again of what's due. So. Don't be afraid when we get here, when you see me showing you stuff, you don't have to do this. I just want to give you like vision for the future. All right, so this is what's due. Um, we've already passed that deadline um, of the makeup work. Thank you for those of you who turned in missing work. Um, I appreciate it. Uh, before class, you're gonna have your brief pause and post. So before our, our meeting at, um, our usual meeting time, which has totally escaped me now. Is it 11.45? I believe it is. Um, so before that, you will have done um, a pause and post from chapter nine, and I'm gonna show you mine in a second. Um, and then on Monday, May 4th, your Flipgrid, and then Thursday, May 7th, your Goodreads project. Again, either of these earlier would make me happy. Let me show you really quickly what I mean by your um, core beliefs post. Um, I guess I should show you the slide first. So chapter nine, core beliefs, which core belief grabbed you and why? Um, and you can post it just at the same place we posted our favorite strategies. I'll show you my, um, my example in a second. This doesn't have to be, you don't have to be long winded about this because we're going to talk about it more. Um, but I'm just curious to see what grabbed you when you looked at those lists of 10 core beliefs. Um, for me, um, I posted here that uh, core belief number two, teachers should scaffold lessons that help stretch young writers. Um, in that section, Gallagher refers to a writing next study that was published in 2007. I didn't see it until 2009, um, but that reshaped my entire approach to teaching this course. Um, hopefully the phrase read, analyze, and emulate that he cited in that um, in that. Uh, and that core belief felt familiar to you. I hope that that's what I've modeled throughout is that we want kids to read something, we want them to analyze it, but we also want them to emulate it through their own writing. And that's my philosophy of teaching um, ELA in a nutshell um, and why I fell so in love with this book when I found it. Okay, so that is uh, what I'd like you to do. Give you a second to pause and post. Welcome back from pausing and posting. I'm anticipating that I'll see some about the five paragraph essay. I almost wrote that one, but then I was like, mm, no, I think that they'll take care of that for me. All right, so what you would have done for your final that you're not going to do this time just because it's been the strangest semester ever, um, as you would have turned in standards, EQs, and UKDs for a five day unit, um, you would have done a description of how you would have sequenced at least five of your texts and associated writing activities that you'd already come up with in the Goodreads so that it flows in one naturally into another. And you could have done that in paragraph or outline form. Um, and a description how you'd have capitalized on the opportunities such as text access, writing audiences and formats afforded you by the media rich environment available to you. Hopefully we've modeled some of those. We didn't, I actually canceled the, um, module on digital learning that you were going to do simply because we've been in, just entrenched in it. Um, so hopefully you found ways to use uh, Padlet and some ways to use uh, um, 
blah, blah, blah. What's it called? Oh, Flipgrid. Um, you can use Blogger. It's just a free website on um, Google. Uh, you can use, uh, obviously, Common Lit to find texts. You can find use Goodreads so students can write reviews of their texts and share them with each other. Um, Taylor Guckert, another one of my former students who presented at the NCTE um, uh, uh, presentation in November said that that's what she did. She had her kids write reviews of their book that they had chosen to read. And then she let them look at those reviews on Goodreads and pick their next, their next book for the next quarter, for the next nine weeks. So I thought that was a cool way to do it too. But you're not having to do that. Just some things to think about. So what might this look like? I'm going to show you an example. Um, yes. Yes, grant access. Okay, so this is posted um, in um, in Canvas, and it really is like just initial planning. When I do an initial planning for a unit, and if you you were in my uh, assessment class, you would actually see this uh, this this unit that came out of this. Maria is in my assessment class, so Maria, this is how I started planning that. Um, I started with my content and skills. Thought about the texts. Um, in a very broad, in a general um, category text um, would be helpful, how I would get them to interact with that text, what writing would come from it, what formative assessment and what differentiation would I need. Um, so that's where you see some of those that I, sh that I showed you in my Goodreads project. Um, I wanted them to work on observations and inferences. I did that with that, that um, armored dove mural and we use the three looks we would use the three looks strategy and they're going to write um and i believe according to this essential question where's power come from who has it and we were going to keep revisiting that and they would do that in blogger that blog would be a pre-assessment for me to see um who was having trouble stating their opinions defending them etc um then we moved to imagery and we would use oranges probable passage you know that they would write a memory poem um, I have a lifeline formative assessments that I did. And if they were, um, if they needed for their memory poem, I would give them some sentence starters. And then you see how that, you'll see some of these that look very um, familiar. Three looks, Padlet, this poem, Blackout Poetry. It's a cool book. It's, you could just order the book and it has um, examples of poems where they take a newspaper article or a newspaper um, or a magazine article, and they black out all the words except for the ones that they keep and make that into a poem. So cool. Um, and they had to do a rationale with that. All summer in a day, tea party, but then a Socratic seminar. I would, I still use the roles that I gave you for that Socratic seminar. Um, and then they were going to write a metaphor me poem. So you see how that, like, just how they, I just took them and strung, took them from one to the next. Um, so that is posted if you want to take a look at that. Um, and I have to go back to this to go. Okay. Um, I also wanted to show that you'll also see, and I'm actually, that's what I thought was going to um, be linked there. I'm going to end my end this and go back to it. Um, screen to 20, 15. Okay. It must be in Canvas. Hey, are you having fun right now? So sorry. Okay, there. that's there for you to look at. I'll publish it right now while you're watching so I'm not the man behind the curtain. All right. Um, this is what um, Kelly did um, for her final supplement. She connected these texts and then she did a little lesson sequence of how she would kind of string those five texts and writing activities together so they made a cohesive whole. Um, and she incorporated digital learning into that as well as some um, scaffolding for English language learners, students who struggle and students who needed a push. And then she talked a little bit about a media rich environment here.
So, um, and, and evaluating credibility of, of sources. Uh, but that is what you would have done that you don't have to do um, this time. But if it's something that you are interested in and you feel like you would benefit from it, I would take a look at this and then just do some sketching and thinking about how you might put those things together, those uh, all of those uh, strategies together cohesively. Because you'll have enough on that Goodreads site to last you um, for an entire semester, if not three quarters, if not a year. Um, so it's really picking and choosing and putting them together in a logical fashion. Um, so I hope um, that that is exciting to you to think you've got that repertoire to draw from. And I think you can even start to do that um, in your practicum experiences that you'll be in next in your student teaching for some of you are doing student teaching next. Um, pull some of those for your genre project. I think you do a genre project. I don't know what it looks like. Um, or any of the requirements in 570, those of you who are secondary. Um, so just some things to think about. Um, I want to share a few thoughts with you about choosing texts. This is something that we never have talked about. So I just want to give you my philosophy on choosing texts. And I know um, actually Andrew and I talked about this a little, um, but it's something that usually comes up in class and we haven't discussed it. Um, I do say in the you know that you're to pick something that's appropriate for middle school kids um, reading level is one thing to consider but maturity level of the content is also important to consider and here's the thing not all middle school kids are the same what might be appropriate for some middle school kids are not appropriate for other middle school kids so when i picked a full class novel i picked something that i knew would be okay with somebody who was with a child who was a young seventh grader to somebody who was a mature seventh grader. Uh, the outsiders fit in there. Everybody connected with that. Um, the content wasn't so um, out there, like the fighting and stuff wasn't so much of a, you know, thing that they'd never been exposed to that it was it was safe. I'll, I'll go with that. I would say wonder is safe as well. Um, that's something I would use with a whole class anything um, else, but I wanted kids to be able to pick something that they would really connect with. Different kids connect with different things. And so I sent a letter home at the beginning of the year that said, your child will be reading constantly in this class. We will have a few shared novels, here they are. Everything else will be chosen by your student. If your student is reading something in my room, I assume they have your permission to read it. Um, I encourage you to talk with your student, uh, your child about the choices they make when they choose free reading books um, in the library and left it at that because I wanted them to read something that they were, that they were ready for. Um, as an aunt, I, I can say that I see so clearly how my niece and my nephew, um, when my nephew was in seventh grade, he was already, he was, he's in ninth now, but he was ready for some harder topics than my niece is. My niece is in seventh grade. She is very childlike still. Um, and there are just some things that she's not ready for developmentally, um, that she would rather I'd like be, have some conversations with her parents about before she read it. My nephew was different. Um, and so every kid is different. And I think it's important to let the parents be involved in that. It also lets you, you know, if the kid wants to read something and they don't take it, I didn't require them to sign anything. Um, I just said, I'm, I operate under the understanding that you and your child have come to an agreement on this. That way, if, if a student is read, ready to read something that maybe their parents aren't um, ready for, um, they can still find something that they're interested in. So it's up to you. There were a few years that I sent, I had teachers sign off or parents sign off on everything kids read, but that was honestly a logistical nightmare. Um, and it took away some of the freedom. So uh, that is the way I handled it and the way I felt good about handling it, a way that, that I felt like honored parents and students. Um, and I think that that might be something you might want to consider. Shared novels, safe, everything else, letter home. I assume that if, if a student is reading something in my class, I assume that you have okayed that. All right. So that's my thoughts on text. You'll probably hear different theories from other people, but that's where I land. Okay. Now. Let's talk about your rubric um, for your final. We'll take a, a look at the one that I will use with you. And it is not opening. Oh yeah, grant access, there we go. Okay, so 
Um, your collection of texts and resources um, are diverse, multiple varied genres, perspectives, topics, cultures. Um, they're appropriate for middle school reading level and subject matter. Um, if they have high school, um, high school characters, I'm going to let it go this time because we didn't talk about this in terms of um, grade approach, grade appropriate. Um, but you would have to reconsider that or make sure, like not read it as a shared novel, consider letting that be a choice novel. Um, texts are relevant. You explain how they connect to important concepts. Texts help students explore their own experience, perspectives, identities, and the appropriate number of titles is housed and described on each bookshelf. All missing information is supplied by you. Reading and writing instruction. Students interact with multiple and varied texts um, and they glean and interpret meaning and, and emulate craft. Most of you have already done that in your, um, this stuff is discussed like in part one of your reviews, this stuff is part two. Um, reading and writing are connected in form and or idea. So you've got some traits in there and you have some strategies. Um, a wide variety of writing strategies is used meaningfully. So there's a, a thousand to choose from in that book. Um, try to vary your topics. I realize there might be one that you like a lot that you might use more than once, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, I mean, you've got so many to choose from, I sh that would be the exception rather than the rule. Um, and then they even use uh, things to be as like a mentor text for a trait. So we're reading this, we're gonna look at how the author makes his voice known, we're gonna analyze um, how the author manifests the voice, like what does he do to do that? And then we're gonna try to emulate that in our own writing. Um, it's apparent that students will write often in both low and high stakes uh, environments. And then we do see that six trait language um, utilized throughout. Um, so that's what I'm going to be looking for when I read your, um, basically your Goodreads reviews that you posted the second time um, is what I'm looking for. And you got feedback from me on all parts of that. Um, and so um, you really, I hope you feel good about that. Um, you don't have to do a strategy and a trait for every text. Um, some, it makes sense to do that. Some, you might just pick one and really focus heavily on the trait. Some, you might pick and, and give a little bit more extrapolation about how you would use one of the strategies from Gallagher. So that is your rubric. All right. So that is it, guys. Um, when we meet, we'll talk about... Um, your core, we'll talk about the core beliefs. Um, we'll talk about any questions you have about planning and how you might string things together if you're thinking in the future. Um, any questions you have about letting kids pick texts? Any questions you have about the final? That's it really is just, you know, having a discussion of this is our, our chance in, on Tuesday to talk. Um, so <laughs> and this one's for this. Uh, this is for you, Yun Chan my skateboarding one. Um, we, you are team awesome. So what's due on Monday, May 4th at noon, record and post your IMB portfolio review on Flipgrid. Watch and respond to at least two classmates videos, one per person, um, one per take, like, so one from your table, think about where we, I still think of you in tables. I think that's funny. Um, and then one, one person from another table. Um, and then what's due Thursday at 10 a.m. is your final Goodreads project. Just post the link in Canvas. Um, and I'll have office hours. I'll let you know when that will be via announcement where you can pop in as you're working on things. Um, I'm not going to grade your, your watching and responding to classmates' videos, but um, I think it's really important. It's a good, um, just a, a character thing. Um, to follow through on that so that everybody gets a chance to hear what everybody else has done since we can't do that in our classrooms and at our tables or in a lineup. Um, so that's it. You guys were team awesome. You're going to do awesome. Um, I'm going to post this early so you'll have a little more time to interact with it before we meet on Tuesday. Um, I look forward to seeing your beautiful and handsome faces on Tuesday. <laughs>